Coaches, good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in today. My name is Chaz Henry. I'm founder of Power Chalk, and today I'm joined by softball pitching coach Denny Tencher. Denny, if you don't know him, is the father and pitching instructor for 2008 College Player of the Year, Angela Tencher. And folks, if you don't know the Angela Tencher story, uh, it, it's really one of the Division I uh, stories of college sports. Uh, here's just one of the highlights. Despite being the leading strikeout pitcher in Division I in 2008, Angela was overlooked for the 2008 Olympic team. And when the Olympic team was fully selected and came to play uh, Angela's Virginia Tech team for a tune-up, Angela no-hit them. So one of the things I recommend you do after this call is go to YouTube and search for Angela Tincher. And the very first result in your video uh, matches will be the last inning of that game. Uh, Denny, do you ever get tired of watching that clip? Every once in a while I'll pull it up to look at something specific that we're doing in form. I might want to compare something and, and, and I'll, I might use that game kind of to look at something and and I'll always get caught up in it and have to watch that last inning and then start searching through and look at other innings. So uh, uh, that's a huge it, was a, it was a game we didn't even go to. We we didn't think it was going to be a real good game because that's such an incredible team, and she had played against them, you know, and tried out against them. And she said, you know, I don't think we can score on them. <laughs> They're going to score on us. I mean, the, the game before, the team walked off the field saying good luck to them, the college team that played them the game before. I think they beat that team 23 nothing. Wow. In five innings. <laughs> wow. Well, it tr truly is a moment. That is, that's an incredible story. Uh, coaches, I've also got Morgan Lewis on the line. Uh, Morgan's a sophomore pitcher at Susquehanna University in Pennsylvania. Morgan, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, coaches, Morgan has uploaded a couple videos to Power Chalk and has volunteered to go under the microscope. Uh, Morgan's got a, a hard stop today at 3.30 uh, for practice. Uh, Morgan, it must be hard to pitch with a parka and mittens on. I, I guess you guys are ready for some sunshine and grass. We definitely need some sunshine and grass up here. We hope today does not hail at practice like it did yesterday. So. Oh, my goodness. Well, Denny, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you the mouse and the screen, and we're going to go straight to work. I'm going to kind of get out of the way and let you tell us, if you would, how you go about using video to instruct a pitcher. And I know you've just had a couple minutes to, to look at Morgan's pitching stroke here. But I, we just want to sit back and watch and kind of go through the process with you of uh, you know, how you would look at her mechanics and, and start to start to help her analyze that. Okay, thanks, Chaz. When we use video, we generally are working with students we've seen before, um, and then we can speak a common language because there are certain things. We, we take a very different approach to pitching. Uh, a lot of pitching is taught from the top down, starting off with wrist snaps and things like that. We tend to start with the legs and the hips and really talk about getting power where a female generates power. So most of the students who we do video work with already know our language and, and some of the drills and some of the things that they don't want to do. So they, they talk a common language with us. Uh, here's a case where I haven't met somebody before. I'm not going to be able to make changes, but I can suggest things that she can be working on. and then. From that, hopefully, she can start feeling certain things and looking for certain things, and and then be able to self-coach a little bit. So when I when I do start, when, the other way that we use the power chalk is somebody will send me a video from Texas or California and say, "Do you see potential in my daughter? And do you see any big issues or reasons why she shouldn't be able to throw faster, better break, or whatever?" So we use it a lot of times to say, "Yes, we do see something." Because when people fly across the country, I want to make sure they're getting what they're looking for. So I like to look at a video ahead of time and just help them feel comfortable. Yes, it's going to be worth the trip and we can do some things. So in this case where we're talking about Morgan, uh, we've only met briefly on the phone, haven't had a chance to work together. So some of the things I'm going to kind of keep simple. And Morgan, if you don't understand something, just jump in there. So let me back the video up to the very beginning. And what we'll generally do is just talk about what's going on in the pitch, where we can improve the pitch, uh, and that's what we're going to do now. I'm not going to get into great detail because some of the language, again, wouldn't be common to what you've heard in a lot of cases. Now, now Morgan, you Morgan, this pitch, do you, do you know if this is a fastball, a changeup, a screwball, or do you? It's a changeup. This is a changeup, all right? Yes. And she told me she throws it off to the side. Uh, I like that. 
if you throw this one well, it's my favorite pitch in softball today. It's something we've been really working to develop, and it, it's more of a drop change. It'll have, uh, it'll, it'll just kill the speed, but it'll also have downspin, so it'll hang in the zone, look good right up to the point that they want it. Then when they start to swing, it's also going to drop off. So even on the college level, if they reload, we call it, and try to anticipate a slower pitch, it's going to change planes, and that's very unusual because a lot of change-ups tend to stay flat through the zone. But in talking to Morgan, uh, you throw this like you, – you want everything in this pitch to be exactly the same mechanics as your fastball. Is that right? Yes, I would just like the ball to go slower. <laughs> you, I'm sorry, I missed that last part? I said I would just like the ball to go slower. Motion the same, but the ball slower. Okay, but you're not changing mechanics. You're doing something yeah. to – to disenable the ball. And, and that's one of the things we see a lot of times with young pitchers. They go up and then they slow down the motion, the legs are left behind, and they just telegraph the pitch and all at once at 14 and under or 16 and under people are killing the change up because those, pitch, those batters are really good at picking up visual cues. So what we're looking for is this should look exactly like the fastball. And you do a good job basically with, with what you're doing here. But we're going to analyze this in light of fastball mechanics. Now, we know talking to Morgan and talking to other, of course, we train a lot of college pitchers, you don't really throw a fastball in college for the most part. So we had to use something else. And we're looking at the basic mechanics, uh, not looking at breaking pitches because they, they have some different mechanics as they go along. But we're looking at basic mechanics as if this were a fastball, realizing it is a change up and see what's going on. So we'll start in super slow motion. And as we start forward, we're just going to learn a few things from the very beginning. We're looking for anything that gives us an advantage. And I like the way you're starting. Everything is very loose and comfortable. I'll say right up front, I like Morgan a whole lot. I've told her on the phone. I love her build. I love her size. I see it. just tremendous opportunities to generate a lot of energy. And, and lastly, I admire Morgan for letting me pick her apart in front of an audience. <laughs> uh, because that says that she wants to, to learn and grow, and, and that's the mark of a good pitcher. They should get better every day, every month, every year. Uh, those who don't end up peaking and, and kind of falling by the wayside. So Morgan's in a real good position. I like her focus. Uh, right at this point, there's a couple of things going on that we'll talk about as we go along, but I want to get moving a little further. If I'm looking at the very beginning, the first thing that I'm looking for is I want a lot of push off the mound. But if we look, what we see right now are very flat feet. Uh, generally, if we're trying to get somewhere, get off the ground, we want to be on the balls of our feet. That's a big key. It's a key in every sport. So when we're pushing off the flat feet, a couple of things are occurring. One, you just don't have any pressure off your heels. If you try to leap as far as you can or as fast as you can and you go off your heels, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Now, you're going to try to roll up on the balls of your feet, but most of your push by the time you get to there is already gone. You've already flexed the legs for the most part, and uh, we'll go forward and you can see. All your push is already done before you ever get up on the ball of the foot, so the ball of the foot really didn't age you in any way. We'll go back to the beginning, come forward once again. So the first thing I'm going to look for is a lot different way of pushing. The other harm in pushing off of a flat foot with a little bend is that you tend to push off of the hamstring muscles. The hamstrings are going to do most of the work, whereas we want the quads to do the work. If you're up on your toes a little bit more, your quads will do the work. Now, men tend to be very strong in the hamstrings, and a lot of what we teach in pitching is passed down from the men's game. They're strong in the hamstrings. Females are quad dominant. So we want the quads, these muscles up here doing a lot more pushing. So we're going to look for ways to get your quads a lot more involved. Does that make sense to you, Morgan? Yes, it does. So we want to look for ways to do that, and that's something I'm not going to be able to do via video. As we back up just a little bit, let's look at this back swing and see how that's going at this point, too, because we're going to try to synchronize a number of things. At this point, Morgan's shoulders are turned this way. Her hips, though, are turned straight to the batter. What we're doing, and, and Loda Daughter always called this the four points for power, and she wasn't sure whether she stole that from someone or whatever, but she said, anytime we get those four points out of line, we're creating a number of issues in our body. We're, we're twisting. Uh, we're not going to be very powerful. Uh, a little bit more risk of injury at that point, you know, in, in the lower back. And also, the problem is we're not going to have a lot of power off the mound. If your catcher were to come up to you and you were to stand in this position, take a back swing, 
with this shoulder here and this one trailing far behind. If she puts her hands on those two shoulders and you're in this position, you won't be able to push her with even five or ten pounds of pressure. You really can't move her a bit. But if your shoulders are square on that backswing, you're going to find that you have tremendous launch forward. So that also negates a couple of advantages as far as the tendon flexing and stretching in the shoulder that give you an automatic uh, rebound of the arm, uh, kind of a rubber band effect. We don't want to ever do that. I don't want to get into it too deeply, but you get a more rubber band effect on the start if your shoulders are sort of square. Uh, if you ever do that, yeah, it's going to be a little painful. We don't want to do that. The thing I like that Morgan's doing right now, if you notice that hand, that ball is facing the second baseman. I want that. I like that. Too many kids come out and have the ball still facing the catcher. Well, the trouble is, if you do that, as you go through the circle, your ball is facing catcher. As you come through the circle, you're going to have to rotate your hand 180 degrees by the time you get to here so that it's facing the third baseman. That's going to slow the arm. It tends to make the elbow fly up or you have a big hesitation while you spin that arm at the top and you don't have fast arm speed across the top. So I really like this. The other thing I like is that this arm is long, but it's not tense. It is very relaxed. The thing I can't say enough about Morgan, her natural tendencies are fabulous. She's very loose and comfortable. We just have to find ways to put in power that don't uh, create more tension in the body. And speaking of which, we're going to run into one. Now, some of the most popular drills that are conventionally taught in softball create great issues. And here is one of those. As Morgan is trying to go forward, we'll see here, she has trouble synchronizing the hand. The left hand is coming way up early, so it's going to come down early. It's far. The left hand, as you can see, is far ahead of the right hand. It's got to do something. Kids are going to do one of two things when their hands are out of line. They're going to throw that left hand way out to the left to stall, waiting on the right hand to get through because it doesn't want to arrive too soon, or it's going to do what's happening to Morgan. It's going to come down early. And the trouble, when it comes down early, the minute it comes down, she's coming down. And you can see the stride length is, is probably only about 50% uh, of where her potential is. She literally is one of those people that could be getting out seven, eight feet. And it cuts down the distance that the batter has to see the ball tremendously, plus it has a lot of power. So what's causing that? Let's go back and take a quick look. As she gets to right here, and you won't be able to see it well on video, what I love is this left arm, um, let me change one of the things I'm going to use here. This left arm at this point is very relaxed. The glove is flopping. She feels really good. But as she starts to move forward, that left arm has to go somewhere, and it's early, and it's not sure what to do. And just here, you can't see it well in this video, but right here, and we have other videos to study, the left arm is hidden by the right arm, but the left arm went into a lock. The minute that locks, the kinetic chain, when you lock something on that left side, it's going to tend to affect everything drastically on the right side. And the whole body just, it's almost a spasm. It, it just, the whole body locks up, and you'll see at that point, boom, the body just fell down. Now, once we've done that, we have some issues because we're not really, we've, we've locked the back side, and you can see how stiff everything suddenly became and how locked up. The back leg on your Morgan really can't get through, and we can't use our hips. So the back leg is lost, and again, we're in that same situation we talked about earlier, where if I pull the line up, the shoulders are going to be very square to the plate, where the hips are very open. Anytime you square your shoulders to the plate, as a female, you'll find that shoulder is very, very weak. It's very opposite of a male. The male shoulder, when facing the target, tends to be strong. The female shoulder tends to be very weak. And if somebody just tries to hold your hand back when you're in that square position, you'll feel a lot of stress and strain on your shoulder and elbow. So we want to try to keep those four points in line. Here again, they pull themselves out of line a little bit. So, so in this case, in this case, Danny, if I can ask you, so you, so you're happy oh, with I'm where? I'm glad to have the break. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're happy with where her hips are. You're saying that she should be facing us more as she, as she brings the windmill, windmill through. Well, we've got things out of line. So no, actually, her hips are too open, and she's having trouble getting her arm around it. Would that be? I'm yeah, sorry, would that be the reason why I would hit my forearm on my hip? Is because my hips yeah. are out of alignment with my shoulders. There are two issues going on causing you to hit your forearm against your hip, and that's something we never want. It kills power. It also, uh, I've seen kids come to me from other places that say, I've got stress fractures in my forearm from hitting my hip so much. And we go, whoa, let's get in there and fix that. 
it can also cause a problem with one of the valves. Um, and let me see if I can clear one thing. Right in here, there's a valve in the vein that returns blood from the hand up to the heart. And you can't actually hit that enough to damage that valve and cause a blood return problem. I'm not trying to be a doctor here, but if your hands are swelling, tingling, or, or hurting, we have to give that some attention. There's a much more serious problem that usually causes, causes those same symptoms. We'll, we'll deal with it another time. Yes, you do not want to be hitting your hip. But what's happening, if you're at this position, there's no place for your, your shoulder or your arm to get clear. So what you'll try to do is you'll try to go around, it, and that's why you're pulling those shoulders around is trying to get clearance. Because if you're totally facing third base, yeah, there's no place for the arm to get through. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, it so does. So then you're trying to turn that shoulder to get it around, and now you're starting to put stress on the shoulder. And you can see it also creates a problem here. Because your back leg is not really helping, your hips are lost behind you to answer Chad's question. No, I'm not happy with the hips, the hips right now. Hips are lost behind. You see your head is pulling out to the side. You've probably seen that in video. Because your head is trying to pull this shoulder, which can't get through. And that shoulder is trying to pull this leg. So you've compounded the problems. And it's just because mostly it's because of what happened with that left hand back here just a couple of frames ago. When that got locked, and whenever it started down in the wrong position, you were really out of balance. And now you see your hips are very recessed. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to get those arms in timing. That's the very first thing I'd do. The other thing when it comes down early is it's going to cause it to slap aggressively on your leg. And that puts a bunch of tension. And you can see it just stops everything in your body. The minute it slaps aggressively on your leg, your elbow stops at your side. And then you try to push on through, OK? So mm -hmm. that will cause several negative effects when that occurs. Uh, a lot of that is because of the way we started. And again, when we and you and I chatted by phone earlier, but as if you're trying to jump a stream, for instance, jump across a, a mud puddle, uh, you'll throw both arms up at the same time to launch, it, not get one going up and the other one coming down to get you off. But there's another issue that we didn't address yet, and you can't see it in this video. We saw it in another one, and I'm not sure how much is occurring here. But if you're stepping across some people call it the power line. We kind of we kind of avoid that term because the power line should be something an instructor uses, but not something a kid should use. But somewhere in here would be perhaps directly toward the play. Uh, anytime you're across that, there's something going on in your body that's causing that. And yeah, I see it going right now. See this glove as it starts forward. Which it, I don't know if you can see from here, but where is that glove? Is it in front of your right hip? Outside uh, your right hip? It's in front of my. Right hip, I think. It's a little bit more. It's maybe over toward this line right here. Yeah. Right? Okay. If it's over there, what that's going to do is wherever, and, and one of our instructors, we train instructors all over the country, and, and one of them is so bright, she, she, she picked this up for me. She said, the first six inches of that glove from the time it leaves your hip, right here, the first six inches determines the path of the left foot. So if that left foot that is going to lead the left foot across. And I do suspect if I was looking at you straight on, probably you'd be stepping across the line. This foot would be a little bit over this way. Yeah, and so you now, caught me. I caught you? You caught me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Didn't mean to. <laughs> but probably the line would actually be more here. And so you'd be across. Now you've got an issue. I've got to get around my hip, and then my hips are also too open. And, and stepping across will cause that to be a problem. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. You know, Denny, you, you raise a good point because, you know, I, I've seen this in other sports and I've seen it in, you know, in, in hitting. Uh, if, if a coach were to look at this and say, well, it's really a problem or it's really just an issue of getting the hips to finish and come on through, and if you didn't address the glove that, that's sort of creating that lag, then, then you're really just putting a, uh, you're just compounding the problem. Is that true? Yes. Well, let me put it this way. If I talk to Morgan in terms of overhand throwing, let's have a talk for just a moment, Morgan. Mm -hmm. Did you, when you first started in rack ball, did somebody ever teach you to point your glove, elbow lock, pointed right at the target? Yeah, like a bow and arrow, yes. They, they taught you that to begin with. By mm -hmm. the time you get to college, they were telling you to fold that glove up, and it should be you know, almost over your heart or whatever, right? 
and yep. you don't throw it that arm locked. Because if you throw that arm locked, then it's going to go down by your side. Your shoulder's going to have to bear all the way to shoulder and elbow. You're not going to throw very hard, and pretty soon you have pain in your shoulder and elbow. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very much the same with pitching. Whatever happens on one side is going to affect the other side. It's going to kill the balance. It's going to kill. It's going to put tension in your body. So we have to really carefully look what's going on in the other parts of the body that causes issues. And in this case, if your left arm throwing overhand is pointed, uh, a center fielder doing that is going to pretty soon have shoulder and elbow problems. That's as a third baseman. So that's why we have that left arm relaxed. It's more. It's East-West elbow, so to speak, one of my friends calls it, one of, my, one of our instructors trains with us to call it that East-West elbows when you're throwing overhand. Uh, you just, nobody in Major League Baseball points the arm locked and throws overhand. Well, that's very much the same thing in, in uh, pitching. We can't get things locked. We've got to be careful. Yes, it's going to, the glove's going to lead me to the target, but I don't want to get it out early, and I don't want to get it in a fully locked, tense position. There are a lot of pitchers you'll see who have that arm pointed out, but if you look real carefully, you see the glove is flopping, things are very loose. The arm is not tight. It's very relaxed, and there'll be a tiny, tiny bend in the elbow. Um, as a sense? question, yes, as mm -hmm. a pitcher, what would you recommend if there's any drills to avoid, like, let's say, hitting your arm on your hip or crossing over the line and getting your arm through the zone? Is there anything you could recommend? Are you, do I have drills to help keep you from doing that? Yeah, would there be any key things for like a young person to learn to avoid like, this issue? Keep you from crossing the line. What I'll do a lot of times is I'll, I'll put a, a pitcher on the mound, and the first thing we want to make sure of is we don't let that glove overlap or hang over the right side. If somebody's standing behind you, they want to make sure on your backswing they're not seeing that glove hang over that side, or you're already going to tend to twist your hips or your shoulders on the backswing. Now, once they're twisted, which way is your body pointed? toward the third base dugout. Therefore, where are you starting to lead everything? Where is, there, where is all the power trying to get toward the third base dugout? You have to fight to keep that from happening. And a lot of kids then turn and swim that glove way out to the side trying to get themselves straight again, and that's a major cause of the glove flying out to the left. All right? So mm -hmm. what I will often do, and you see where I have you pause, is I'll say, okay, I don't want the glove to overlap. I want to come back and stop at the right hip if you're right-handed. Uh, not let it hang over because it's already twisting me. And basically, I would say, in other words, on the backswing itself, I don't want my elbow to cross over past this point. I don't want my elbow over my navel, if that makes sense. Okay? Keep that elbow yes. on that side, and that will keep the glove where the glove should come back if you are facing me. It should be right in here. I don't want it hanging way out in here. Okay? Then I will take and put, oh, something like a spinner or some rightly covered up colored object out here, and you see where I have the dot, out slightly to the left of the left side of the mound, and say, I want that first six, six inches of that glove to come out in that direction. That way I'm leading my left foot forward and not trying to drive my left foot across this way. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's the very first six that inches of where your glove goes. The very first six inches determines your path. If your shoulders are are staying pretty square on the backswing. Makes sense. Now, getting the side can be caused by a number of things. One is that you don't do. One I like. In your backswing, let's just go back to the start, and let me run a little faster until I get the point I want to slow it down. In your backswing, it looks to me like you're swinging straight back. It doesn't look like your arm's getting lost behind you there. Kids who do throw it behind them, if they tighten this muscle right here on the back swing, if they pull it back, they'll tend to pull the ball back behind them. It'll be going out in this direction. I don't see that with you from this angle. If you just let it relax as it goes back, kind of throw your hand down and back, then it'll tend to stay in line. As they come forward, now a lot of kids who rotate late, if you hadn't rotated the ball in time, and let's just see how you do you are a little late in your rotation, just a little bit right here. If you'll see from this frame to this frame, that was a little alarm speed loss. If you just started rotating that ball a little sooner, you wouldn't have to have that sudden jerky turn. See how much the hand is turned? Yeah, you went mm -hmm. 180 degrees. Oh, I didn't see that earlier. Thank you <laughs> for pointing, you know, getting my attention here. Look at your hand. It, the ball facing first base. In mm -hmm. two frames, you went to third. So how much are you having to slow your arm down to do that? 
and that tends to throw the elbow out. Now, yours didn't do it. You did a great job holding it in. But a lot of kids, when that happens, that'll bend that elbow out. That will put the ball back over their head, way over their head, maybe over, their, maybe over your left ear once it's there. Then the path of it is coming down right behind their hip. And that's another reason for hitting the hip is if that arm is bent. Third reason for hitting the hip, you're not guilty of, you don't square your hips to the catcher. A lot of kids have been taught to square the shoulders and hips back to the catcher. That's the other reason why they hit the hip so often. Okay. Making sense? It does. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. Nobody's ever told me that before. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, as we're looking now, now let's go to here. When that glove came down too soon and we got to here, the trouble is you hadn't got your hips through yet. Your leg is still planted firmly on the ground back here. And you, then you, you, you slap the glove against the side with a tense arm, so they put all kinds of tension. You can see your shoulders are very tense and your hips are very neutral. And Morgan and I talk about something, so we'll be honest here. We don't have to recreate the, com the, the conversation. But I ask you, and I always ask students who come from around the country, and, and it surprises me that they haven't been taught this. But now you can, you can sound really smart, Morgan. How should your hips feel when you pitch? Tight, loose, powerful, or neutral? I want to say powerful, because I think that's a Powerful, answer. just yes. like a hitter. When you throw overhand, should your, shoulders feel, should your hips feel tight, loose, powerful, or neutral? Loose. Powerful. Oh, okay. Powerful. Powerful. I changed powerful. my answer. Think about, yeah. Yeah, you, you drive your leg, you drive your front foot or off your back foot to create energy and momentum to the target. You plant your front foot to create resistance, and that resistance causes core acceleration, causing tendons through your body to stretch and snap naturally. Nothing artificial. We let the core do everything, and a female that's critical. When you bat, so you want your hips to feel tight, loose, powerful, neutral, powerful. That is core acceleration again, using our feet to create energy up from the ground, core acceleration, upper body stays relaxed, tendons stretch and recover, and because of the musculature and the transfer of energy, when they snap, that fat puts through faster than you can imagine. If you're playing tennis, core. Hips lead everything, especially in females. If you play golf, it's exactly the same motion. Powerful hips, relaxed upper body. Some of my best students I have too, they're, the mom was a uh, LPGA Tour member for 17 years. Well, she understands pitching because she knows how you hit a golf ball. Another one was a dad that was on the PGA Tour. He understands this. Uh, so they transfer to pitching real well. But most kids have no idea how the, the uh, hips should feel. They think they'll play loose or, or, or neutral or whatever. And in your case, she was a very neutral. Now, here's your next chance to sound good. How should your shoulders feel? Tight, loose, powerful, or neutral? Loose. Loose. Okay. How do you feel? Mine feels pretty loose most of the time. Look, look right there. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> most of, yeah, that's right not there. loose. It was loose going yeah. around, and then it got really, really tense. Well, yeah, you know what, you know what Denny, Denny, you raise a good question here, or a good point, too, that I've seen a lot with golfers, is a lot of times what people feel is not what they see in the video. And, and that, that's why it's exactly. important to see this and, and to e either, you know, confirm or or contradict what you're feeling. Right. A lot of times I'm working with kids who has a locked left elbow, just locked tight, and that's, that's shut down the whole body. And I'll have her pitch, and she'll say, no, it's loose, it's loose, I'm not locking it. And I'll say, okay, lay the ball down, pitch me 10 without the ball, lift your elbow full time. It takes them 10 pitches watching it relax before they understand what it feels like to do it right. Right. Then they can immediately pick it up. But what I like about Morgan is, if you watch, she was right. They feel loose most of the time. Watch how loose her shoulders feel most of the time as she starts through here. She, uh, it's, it's, it's just a picture of being really relaxed. And she's kind of going, but right there when that elbow, when that left side came down too soon, then it forced everything onto the front side. Back side lost its role. Things tightened up. And then we got on the front side, and there's no energy from the hips. So the hips got kind of lost behind. And that's when the shoulders suddenly had to tighten up and try to do the job. And with a female, you know, you're, I'm 60% upper body strength. She's 60% lower body strength. She's got to derive that energy from the lower half of the body. And, and, and in this case, it was just locked out of position. So she just didn't know that that didn't happen. The other thing, uh, or that that wasn't happening in the right sequence. The other thing that happens when that left side comes down, watch her stride. She was starting to come out with a huge stride. She was getting ready to get off the mound. 
but that left side drove her right back down, and then she was lost. Interesting. Making sense so far? Yes, it does. Well, you know what, guys? Right. It sounds, sounds like we're making good strides, but we're also up against the 30-minute mark, so I'm going to have to... Oh, uh, really? I, we are, and I'm going to have to let Morgan uh, get off to practice. And Morgan, thank you so much for participating today. Best of luck to the Crusaders this season, and uh, best, thank you best so of much. luck to you. Thank you thank so much. Thank you, Morgan. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Coaches, that's it for today's session. Like I said, we could keep going. Um, Denny, at this point, I'm going to change. I'm going to take the screen back, and I want to tell that uh, I want to tell the players and the coaches out there. Coaches, if you want to work with Denny Tincher and you, you want to get a lesson or you want to, as a coach to, to, uh, to get coaching lessons, uh, you can find him at powerchalk.com slash tensure. You can also find him at www.tensurepitching.com. At this point, I'm going to stop the recording. This recording will be available on YouTube, but I'm going to stop the recording side of it. Uh, Denny, if you've got a couple minutes, we'll uh, take a couple questions.